This event is free to the public if you want to help DREDF in continuing to provide our free events and services to the community. Please consider a financial don donation. You can donate on our website, dredf.org, or if you are here in person, you can place cash or a check in our donation box, which is located on the table to my left. Okay, on to the main event and why we are all here today. I am a huge Sammy Shock fan, and I could not be more pleased and proud to host Dr. Shock here at the Ed Roberts campus. Dr. Schock is an Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and her most recent book is called Black Disability Politics. If you haven't read the book yet, I highly recommend it. It's very accessible. It's also available free online in an open access format. Dr. Schock identifies as a fat, black, queer, disabled femme, and a pleasure activist. She is active on Twitter with more than 40,000 followers. You can read more about Dr. Shock online, including on our event page. Dr. Shock will be interviewed by Jonathan Glader, professor of law at her own Berkeley Law. Professor Glader writes extensively in the areas of higher education law and policy and student debt, and teaches many different subjects that intersect with Dr. Shock's work including critical race studies and disability law. And our mutual friend, Rabia Belt, says that he is a real sweetie pie. <laughs> we are delighted to have Professor Glader and Dr. Schock together for what I know will be an amazing conversation. Thank you, everyone. All right, with an introduction like that, I have to be really <laughs> careful to live up to this sweetie pie. Um, uh, it's really a, an honor to be here with all of you um, this evening. Thank you for coming out. Uh, the, the book is wonderful, and I, I want to emphasize the point about accessibility, which I think we'll, we'll hopefully talk about in a, in a moment. Um, but I'm going to go straight to my list of questions, because you don't want to hear from me. We want to hear from Dr. Shalk, who can explain to us um, some of the really kind of difficult concepts that she renders in very understandable ways in the book. And, and I think that was part of the project. So my, my first question really is, what prompted you to undertake this project? And, and my second question will be, and who's it for? All right, oh yeah, there we go. Hi y'all, thank you so much for being here in person and online, hi people online. Um, so there's kind of the long and the short version of how I got to this project. The long version is, in the most abbreviated form. But I took my first disability studies class in undergrad, which I was very lucky to do. It wasn't a common experience for a lot of folks. And um, after that first class, I took as many classes as I could on disability because it just blew my mind that I had never been taught or anyone had talked to me about disability as a political issue um, in the way that I had talked to folks about race and gender and sexuality. Um, and at one point I was taking a disability cl studies class and I was also taking a black feminist theory class and I kept being like, it seems like these things should be talking to each other. It feels like this chapter on black women and lupus should be engaging with disability studies and it's not. And no one's talking about black women <laughs> over here. So at like 20, I was trying to figure out, <coughs> excuse me, the connection between these systems, because to me it seemed very clear and obvious, and there was no scholarship that was really doing that. So it's kind of been the thing that I've been trying to do for a long time. Um, but in particular for this book, I, I'm really trying to bring more folks who do black studies and do critical race studies to come to disability studies, rather than just having disability studies folks like dip their toe into critical race studies, which I feel like has been mostly the move. Um, and I wanted, I just want to bring more folks into the conversation. Um, and this was, the book itself was sparked by reading Alondra Nelson's Body and Soul, which is about the Black Panther's health activism. And in that book, she cites Irving Zola, which is, he's considered one of the founders of disability studies. And that was the spark for me to really start looking at black health activism as a place where black disability politics were being developed, but not talked about in disability studies. 
So the audience for the book, I say pretty explicitly at the beginning of the book that it is a book for black people and black disabled people in particular, but that of course I understand other people will read it and I want other people to read it, but it is not being written to or for non-black people. Um, the way I describe it in the book is like, imagine that you've come into my living room, I'm having a conversation with other black disabled people. You're welcome to be here and listen and learn, maybe contribute sometimes, but this is not your conversation. I'm having a conversation with other people. Um, so yeah, that's the hope, to bring more black people into conversation about disability justice and into disability studies with the hope that we can start to understand how disability operates within black communities rather than just simply borrowing from a predominantly white disability studies. So you've already alluded to some of the doctrinal, what, what we as law professors would call doctrinal lines, right? These scholarly research silos in which we operate, right? So critical race studies, disability studies. And the book, I think, really tries to trouble these distinctions, right? And force us to question them. And I have to tell you, as a law professor, that's really hard because one of the things we do in law school is, is teach students analogize and distinguish. That's the game. Say it's like some prior case that came out your way. Say it's not like some prior case that came out against the position that you're in. And that whole project is something that is worrisome after, to me after reading the book. And I, I wonder if you can say more about the, the risks of trying to analogize and distinguish when we're talking about race and disability status as these, these categories, uh, theoretical categories? Yeah, I think that when we move towards analogies and comparisons, it makes hard for us to see the connections and the way that these systems are actually dependent upon one another, built upon one another. Um, in the book, I talk about T.L. Lewis's definition of ableism, which is my favorite. I don't have it memorized, so I will not be reading it, you know, from my brain to you. Um, but the last line of the definition of ableism and the definition engages concepts of um, productivity and excellence and normativity in the last sentence is, you do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. And that's where I think analogies fail, is that we know that ableism can be used against folks, whether or not they identify as disabled, whether or not they have a disability, because of the way they are perceived, and that perception is often based on race and gender and sexuality in the way that we are outside of another norm, but then are read as lacking able-mindedness, as not being as intellectually capable. And so then ableism is applying to us as well, even if we don't identify as having a disability. Um, and I think we see that in all kinds of places, historically, um, you know, the DSM had homosexuality in it for a very long time, right? That's a pretty obvious example. Um, but more recently, I think the conversations around trans folks and trying to restrict trans health care, um, the most recent law in Missouri is trying to say that if you have depression or autism that you cannot receive care because all of your comorbidities have to be resolved before you can transition, right? So we can see how the connection between different systems are adding layers of ableism for folks, um, whether or not they identify as disabled. So yeah, I think that when we compare, it treats them as distinct, right? And they are not distinct things. There's really significant overlap and mutual support happening between these systems. So if, if I'm understanding you right, then these systems of subordination along lines of race, along lines of disability status are, are mutually reinforcing so, so there's this sentence in the introduction, ableism negatively impacts all black people whether or not you consider yourself to be disabled. And I wonder if you can, you can take that apart a little bit for, for us so that we can, we can understand how this works, that, that ableism can have effects along lines of race and racism can have effects along lines of disability status. Yeah, so for me, the, I use an example frequently in terms of reactions to police violence. Um, particularly in 2016 when mm, everything happened that turned our world upside down. Um, I had a lot of folks, non-black folks, talk to me about the fact I would talk about feeling very paranoid. Frequently very paranoid anytime I saw a cop or 
heard sirens, heard sirens on the radio that wasn't even a real siren. Like my heart was in my throat. Um, and there was a lot of anxiety and tension. And folks were like, well, it's not that common and it's not going to be you. And well, really dismissive of that fear, right? And that fear is being then phrased and interpreted as, as paranoia, as overreaction, as something that is uh, a psych disability of some sort, a condition versus a pretty rational reaction <laughs> to the world in which we live. Um, we've seen in a lot of cases with police violence where folks will say, well, I thought this person was dangerous, right? I thought this person was out of their mind based on the way that they were behaving, um, which might be, you know, the person who was injured in a car accident and was seeking help, right? And then was shot because they were moving and behaving in a way that did not align with what folks were expecting. So because our reaction to a racist world is read as inappropriate by a lot of people as an exaggeration, then we're read as lacking able-mindedness, as lacking rationality in relationship to the larger world. And then that can be used against us in various ways, whether or not we have a psych disability or not. Um, so that's one of the ways, one sing singular way. Um, I also think about, I was recently yesterday at UCSF um, talking to their medical school, and there was a person there who was talking about being taught as recently as 2013 that black people do not experience pain in the same way, right? So that someone who just had surgery just needs Tylenol. They don't need any other kind of drug because they don't experience pain in the same way, right? So we experience this kind of medical and social ableism, whether or not you identify as disabled, because our bodies and our minds are interpreted as being different from the norm, which is read as this like white male able-bodied standard. So I was gonna pivot to police violence a little later. This is the selection that, uh, but, but I feel like you've opened the door. So I wanna, I wanna, I wanna fra frame the question and I'm, I want to ask you to read that, that paragraph um, that I showed you in the book. Um, and, and here's the question. I, in the book, there's several points where Dr. Schalk talks about the tension between criticism of harmful conduct, right, and subordination or marg sorry and subordination or marginalization of people who have disabilities as a result of harmful conduct to condemn the one without contributing to the subordination of the other um, and I, the, she wrote it better than I can explain it so I'm going to ask her to read one paragraph from from the book um, so this is in the praxis interlude. Um, so in terms of the structure of the book, um, I deal with two historical organizations, the Black Panther Party, the National Black Women's Health Project. And after the two chapters on the Black Panther Party, there's a praxis interlude where I attempt to talk about what are the lessons we can learn from the mistakes or the missteps uh, or the ways that the Black Panthers didn't necessarily go as far as we might want. Um, and this is one of the examples of how to respond to disabling violence. Um, so this is on page 75. There's much to say about the disabling police violence that Blake, Jacob Blake, um, experienced and how Blake's personal history and behavior at the scene were used by right wing and mainstream media as well as by the public to excuse this violence. For the purposes of discussing how to enact black disability politics here, I focus specifically on how to apply the three tactics for fighting disabling violence in this contemporary case. I chose to include this contemporary example because when the news broke that Blake had survived and could no longer walk, I saw multiple news outlets such as CNN use phrases like suffering from paralysis and read several social media posts where people called Blake's injuries horrific, a tragedy, and a fate akin to death. The emphasis on pain in public discussion of Blake stems partially from Blake's social media message via his lawyer's Twitter account on September 5th in which he mentions being in constant pain. Most news and social media reactions failed to acknowledge, however, that anyone with or without a spinal cord injury would be in pain 13 days after being shot in the back seven times. The physical pain Blake was experiencing and continues to experience with the neuropathy is not synonymous with paralysis, spinal cord injury, or disability generally, but these things frequently get conflated in an ableist world 
that believes most or all disabled people are constantly suffering because of their disabilities. When it comes to black disability politics, however, we must work to acknowledge and empathize with the reality of Blake's pain without making pain and disability the entire focus. The first tactic in approaching Blake's story as a black disability political issue is to focus on the excessive violence by police, two instances of tasering and seven gunshots to the back as the problem, the source of the harm. So when I read that, first I sat back and said, wow. But when I read that, I started thinking, okay, what do I need to do differently? I teach criminal law. So we're talking about socially harmful, horrible fact patterns all the time in that class. And, and I thought, okay, what can I do differently? What should I do differently in distinguishing between the harmful conduct and the person who has been on the receiving end of that harmful conduct whose life may be irrevocably changed? And I wonder if you have guidance in pragmatic terms for us in how we should engage in that parsing. Yeah, so I talk about a couple of things. The first is this point of focusing on the violence as the harm, the violence as the problem. The disability that results from the violence is not the problem. The violence, the harm is the problem. But we can acknowledge that there's harm there, right? This is an aspect of disability, of black disability politics that we can acknowledge trauma and harm and pain and potential distancing from disability identity that results from that, um, especially when someone has a newly acquired disability. Um, so we want to focus on that as the problem. And then I think the next stage is rather than just focusing on the pain that someone is in, the suffering that someone might be experiencing, again, directly because of this violence, not necessarily because of disability, um, is to focus on how do we provide long-term support. Right, often, um, and you can correct me on this because I'm not a lawyer, right, some of these claims are based on like pain and suffering. This is the, what we're trying to get like, um, retribution for. But if we focus on what are the real supports that someone needs and what does that cost, that's what someone needs. They need the actual support to be able to live their life. That means that, that Jacob Blake would need an entirely new accessible home and might need home care and will need significant therapy to get through the trauma, right? What if that was the focus of our efforts of how to actually provide support um, in this chapter, I also talk about the fact that Jacob Blake's children were in the car when he was shot. Those children also need psychotherapy, support, care, right, to deal with the PTSD of seeing something like that. So if we can shift to the violence is the problem, and how do we actually support these folks who have now been disabled by this violence, rather than just fixating on the fact that someone has been disabled, I think that that's where we start to shift. So if we're in like a lawsuit situation, what what's the long-term care that is needed that now needs to be provided by that police department financially to make sure that Jacob Blake can live a full life as a disabled person and go through everything that he needs to go through to get to that point, right? Because we do experience transition with newly acquired, especially traumatically acquired disability. So you already alluded to the structure of the book with these, these practice interludes. And um, that was also on my on my list, so I'm going to follow your I'm going to follow your lead <laughs> through this conversation. Uh, I, and I wonder if you can say a little bit more about the decision to structure the book that way. C again, the accessibility seems to have been really important and is is a real success. Often, often kind of critical theory is is difficult to access, and and so the the practice interludes I assume are a step toward promoting that. And if you could say a little bit how you thought about how you thought about that. Yeah. I mean, accessibility matters to me um, <laughs> as a disability studies scholar, and that means a lot of things, right? That means the open access version, which I strongly encourage you to get, share, tweet, uh, put on your Instagram, Snapchat, whatever you use, please put it out there. Um, I paid my press a lot of money um, to make this happen, so I would love for people to use the open access version. Um, but that also means using accessible language um, as much as possible, using plain language, or at least breaking down the more complicated, more academic jargon, so that the book is not just legible to people who are in the academy. For me, a book in particular, a book that is based on activist history and includes interviews with contemporary activists, 
if the activists I interview pick up this book and are like, what does this say? That is a failure for me. It's an absolute failure if they can't see and understand their own quotes and their own representation within this book. And it's and I want it to be something that they're proud of and able to share and circulate within their movement communities. Um, so it's really important for me to write in a clear and accessible manner. Um, and then the Praxis interludes actually came from a suggestion from one of the anonymous readers. So anonymous reader, whoever you are, thank you. Um, one of the reviewers for Duke um, originally the book was set up in a very chronological order and kind of all these lessons were at the end with the, the chapter on the interviews with contemporary disabled activists. And the, the reader suggested that I change that up, um, that I bring the contemporary and the activist elements, the how-to earlier into the book. Um, so that was the impetus for it, that someone was like, what if we rearranged how this happened? And I'm really glad that they did because I think it does help ground it in activism throughout rather than making it feel just like a history because I'm not a historian. I think some historians are like, what is this? And it's not a history. I'm so sorry. It's not how I was trained. It's a theory book that uses history. Um, so yeah, that's how it came about. And I was also finishing the book in 2020, like literally in June of 2020, that was my goal to finish the book. And so I was still, between being in the streets, was finishing the final parts of the book. And so that was another reason as I was involved in the uprisings in Madison and seeing the way that black disabled folks were really taking charge in this moment of making sure that we were organizing in ways that were COVID friendly, COVID safe, COVID conscious, um, really inspired me to make sure that I was putting that praxis element really forward so that it could be useful for people um, because I want us to change how we're organizing. I want us to not lose the things that we were doing in 2020 just because the world says that this is over. Um, and even if one day COVID does not exist in our world, um, we still need more accessible organizing. We still need to tell people, hey, we're gonna be walking for four miles. Is that a thing your body can do? Um, or, hey, it's really hot outside, so we brought some water. Do you need some water? Little things that can change who can be involved and how people are involved and make people feel like they are wanted there, that they're important there, that they have a role. Um, for me, I'm a person that can't walk four miles, but I was happy to drive my car in front of or behind the protesters, and my car was full of food and water, and when we would stop, I would distribute food, and that was my way of being involved with the body that I have and the risk that I'm able and willing to take, right? And there were other folks that were doing other things. Um, so it was really important for me to bring that forward because I was seeing it, and, you know, I think for many of us, 2020 was a moment of, like, urgency, um, but it felt really urgent for me to put that in the book. I felt like I needed to make sure that we were remembering this moment and taking those lessons forward. So that leads me to the historical question because there's a really kind of elegant through line, and I don't know if you intended this, but, but, but the praxis sections that connect us now or, or 2020 and, and more recently to protests over Section 504 back in the late 1970s. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about that history, because you say you're not a historian, <laughs> but, but there's, there's definitely history here, and, and there's history that, while s some aspects are widely known, some aren't. So I, I want to invite you to share what you found was surprising or what you didn't know when you dug into the relationship, for example, between the Black Panther Party and those protests um, um, in San Francisco. Yeah, so the the first chapter of the book starts off with this, and it's it's great to be like in this area um, to talk about it. And for me, what was surprising is that everything I had heard about the 504 through um, disability history was that the Black Panthers brought food, which is cool. That's cool. Um, but when I actually dug into the Panthers' archives, there was so much there. They were writing, they covered the story more than any other nationally distributed newspaper. Um, they were covering more disabled folks of color in the movement than any other paper um, because most of the leaders um, were white, so those were the folks that were most likely to be interviewed. So there was so much more that they were doing than just bringing 
food, even though that was very important to, to feed people and still remains important to feed people in our movement work. Um, so that was one thing that surprised me. And I really just, I love the way that the Panthers use their knowledge of how to negotiate and be in contact with federal agents. Um, so Corbett O'Toole in her memoir talks about this, that on one of the first nights that the Panthers brought food, she was, happened to be in the lobby, and the Panthers, you know, got there, and the FBI said, you know, can't bring that in here, can't come in. And the Panthers were just like, okay, um, we're going to go get more Panthers and come back. <laughs> and then we'll bring more Panthers, until you just let us set up the food and leave. That's what we're going to do. And eventually the FBI backed down. Right, and so teaching disabled folks who might not have had in this close of interactions with the FBI and with police some of the ways to engage in, in a way that is not escalating, right, but that is clear and firm and direct was so important for later kind of disability organizing. So I think that that, that learning that happened between the groups through just the modeling, right, not a, a formal training that we did, but just watching people do things and be like, oh yeah, we can do that. We can do it like that. Um, is really important, and it wasn't just hey, we gave some crips some food. Like it really was a much more clear exchange. Um, they interviewed people, right? They covered some of the the hearings that were happening. So the Panthers did so much more, and were also themselves learning in the process, right? They eventually made all of their buildings wheelchair accessible. So there's things that that exchange was happening through this movement work in a way that I think has been obscured in the history. Um, in the Panthers, for the scholarship that's on the, on the Panthers, I couldn't find any Panther scholarship that talked about their involvement in the 504. Nobody writes about it um, at all. And then in, again, in disability history, it, it tends to be kind of a footnote. Um, only Sue Schweik's article um, on Brad Lomax, L-O-M-A-X, um, he was, that's the only article that really was like diving into that history. So yeah, it just surprised me that there was so much exchange and yet it gets just like footnoted as like they brought us food. And it's, uh, so I'm told I need to hold the mic closer to my mouth. Is this, this good? Okay. Uh, out, uh, this is not how law school classes work. So I don't, <laughs> I don't not use, um, I'm part of the book, uh, is this very close read of the press coverage right, by the Panthers of those protests. And you are not, uh, you are critical. Uh, I mean, you are, you are critical of some of the coverage, mm -hmm. right? And, and I'm mentioning it because it points to the instability of the language that we use when we're talking about race and disability, right? We use different words for mm -hmm. concepts now than we did um, even five years ago, yeah. right? And so I wonder, and, and you're careful about passing judgment and saying that using the wrong terms means that this is not a potential ally. And I wonder how you reach the conclusion when, when what you've got is the news article, right, that, that's decades old, uh, how, we make, how we draw conclusions about who, what someone's views are on an issue when they're using terms that are maybe not, right, the most sensitive, most nuanced terms. Yeah, for me, it's putting those words into the larger context of the actions, the behaviors, um, again, the, the level of representation, the engagement that, so the words um, that, that I talk about are, they refer to Brad Lomax as suffering from MS regularly, um, which again, it's not a word that we would want used to talk about disabled folks. Um, they also use the word inspiration to talk about the protest, um, but I do, I push on that one because they don't use it to describe disabled people. They use inspiration to, de to describe the protest and the success of the protest, and one time to refer to the fact that folks were using um, the, the black civil rights song, We Shall Overcome, as a source of inspiration within the protest. So I, I, I nuanced that one because I'm like, I know we have a knee-jerk reaction to the word inspiration, rightfully so, and the way it's actually being used. And so that's what I want to encourage folks to do is to look beyond the word itself, especially when we're talking about communities that might not share the language, communities or individuals that are coming into disability consciousness, 
I think that knee-jerk reactions to language can push people out. And I've seen it happen in disability organizing and in disability studies spaces where, for example, you know, a parent of a disabled child is trying to figure some things out and using language that we don't use in community. And people are so quick to shut down the language without actually listening to what the person is trying to ask or say. And it pushes people, particularly folks of color, out. Because if you are a black mother trying to take care of your disabled child and you come into this very white space and all of a sudden a bunch of white people are yelling at you about how ableist and terrible you are, you are not coming back to that space. Which means we have just disconnected a black child, a black disabled child from disability community because of the way we're treating someone for using the wrong language. Now, of course, if we correct people and they're still like, nope, not gonna do it, we can have some conversations, right? But that knee-jerk reaction to the language without actually listening to the content, to the intent, um, is really, I just think it's important as we are trying to bring more folks in. Um, and I think about this a lot in the wake of long COVID, we have a lot of new disabled people in this world. We have a lot of newly disabled people who are coming into this identity for the first time, coming into this experience for the first time, grieving the loss of whatever body or mind they thought they had, whatever futures they thought they had. And I'm seeing a lot of disabled people online being snippy with folks, being like, well, that's the way it's always been for us. Like, yes, <laughs> yes, and these people have to go through their process. And I think we're in a moment where it behooves us to welcome people gently, to not force identity labels onto folks when they are not ready, but to allow people to learn from our community about the things that are important, right? Like, hey, you're having trouble with your stability right now? Here's this website with a whole bunch of canes. You don't have to identify as disabled to use a cane. You could just use a cane if you need to use a cane. You need to learn how to rest. You need how to learn to negotiate some accommodations. You don't have to be ready for this label, but here are tools that are gonna be really useful for you. And as people receive those tools and come into terms with their body, then maybe they will come into identity community, right? But we force people out when we force the labels and the words before the understanding and the experience is there. So if I'm hearing you right, this is a, this is a call for empathy right, which is not something that's necessarily explicit in, in the book, but seems to be one of the projects of the book, e notwithstanding what you said about who it's for. So I, I wonder if you might want to say a little bit about empathy and the role of the, the book project in yeah. promoting empathy. I mean, I know I learned from reading the book and seeing, right, history through the eyes of, in some cases, figures that have not gotten a lot of attention in the past. Um, so. I assume this is, this is an explicit goal. Sorry, I'm doing better with the mic. Yeah, I mean, empathy and just expanding our understanding of, again, the ways that folks come to disability. Um, you know, so in my own experience as uh, a person who came into disability studies pretty young and into community young, but did not yet identify as disabled because I didn't know if I was allowed and I didn't know if I, it counted because I didn't have a diagnosis and I wasn't on medication and all these other things that I used to say I don't know yet. Um, I had people that were like, call me when you finally identify or like just, you know, and really pushing it on me in ways that I was like, ugh, this feels icky. Um, and you know, as a queer person, I think like I, 13 year old me didn't need, need someone being like, you're gay. Like, I, just let me figure it out <laughs> on my own. Um, so the folks that I most connected with were the people that offered me wisdom around chronic pain without requiring anything of me, right? Um, without judging whether or not I identified yet or the language that I used to talk about myself. Um, and I think that that is what I want for more folks, right, is like gentleness with one another with the goal of building community. I think that, that we're used to being harsh because the world is harsh to us, right? But when we're trying to welcome folks into our world and get folks on our side, I don't know that that harshness, those hard lines around identity labels and the words that we use, um, I don't know that that's the way, again, especially in this moment where we have so many newly disabled people, um, not just with long COVID, right, also just folks who have had 
medical care put off or delayed because of lack of access to hospitals, right? We had folks um, who just couldn't get the care that they needed. So I think that there's a lot of disability growth right now, but this moment in particular, um, it feels urgent to me that we shift the way we are approaching disability identity and disability community to make sure that folks are getting what they need and getting that raised political consciousness that brings us to identity, right? For me, identity is a community building tool and that's it. Um, I care much more that people are getting the things that they need and that they have that critical lens so they know they're not alone, so they know that it's not their fault when doctors are terrible to them, that there's this larger experience that they can put themselves in context with. Um, and in doing the book tour the last couple of months, I've had black folks say like, I'm rethinking how I identify or I'm seeing my family members in a different light because I didn't think of them as disabled, but now I'm seeing that that's actually what has happened, that there's a history of this in my family. And that is heartening to me because I think there's just, there has been this distancing because of the harm of racism that has put false labels in, on us um, to have folks come into an understanding of disability that is not just defined by who is getting SSI or who is getting formal accommodations in school within the black community is really important. So one thing I'm hearing then is that organizing around pro a progressive agenda is at the end of the day a pragmatic project, right? Built on establishing these relationships and building bonds of community. Uh, so first I wanna ask if, is that right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we have to be pragmatic in a moment where a lot of things are going wrong. <laughs> a lot of things are going wrong. Um, and so if we want more folks on our side, so to speak. Um, yeah, we have to be practical in the way that we approach people and bring them in um, because I think there are a lot of moments where people do associate disability with whiteness or leaders in disability rights and disability organizing with whiteness and then are, are less inclined to move on disability issues when they don't see disability organizations responding to police violence, for example, responding to things that are particular to communities of color. So I think it's important that we are expanding our lens to bring folks in um, so that we can have this, like, again, I talk a lot about collective liberation in the book, right? That's, that for me is the goal. That there is no way that we can be free without all of us being free. So then my, my next question is, what are the conditions or circumstances that facilitate right, the building of those relationships and the establishment of those kinds of alliances? And, and I wonder about this because we're coming out of the pandemic, we're coming out of a period of protest that you describe in the book, which I would think, okay, this is exactly the kind of crucible I want in order to, to forge these relationships going forward. But I'm not so sure, and I'm, I'm curious what you think. Okay, the question is like, what do we do? What do we do? Yes. <laughs> what do we do? Yes. Okay, what do we do? Um, there's a lot of things that we can do. So I think on a consciousness raising level, I think that that's kind of what this book is for me. It's a way of encouraging consciousness raising around disability um, identity and experiences within black communities. And ideally also, I hope that it helps other racialized communities develop their own understandings of like what does disability politics look like for our community. Um, so I think that consciousness raising is a key element. I mean, you know, I'm a gender and women's studies person, like I think that that's a core part of it is that individual consciousness raising and education and then making clear within all of our organizing work the way that it intersects with different issues. Um, in Madison, I'm seeing more and more folks that are doing reproductive justice work talking about disability, really talking about disability, access to um, raising children as a disabled person, to being able to get birth control or resist being forced on birth control, right? Seeing more folks talk about the way that different changes in policies are also gonna impact disabled people. I wanna see that brought more into quote unquote other movement work. Um, and so I think that's part of it is that more dis like disability justice folks connecting with these other organizing to help folks have the language and the lens to understand it. But I think we need folks that are doing the bridge work. I talk about this with Brad Lomax, that he was doing that bridge work to say, okay, I'm gonna connect these two and I'm gonna connect these two. 
Um, and I will say, because I think that those of us who are like interested in this tend to burn ourselves out, you don't have to do everything. Like I'm not a policy person. I can't tell you what policies are gonna change the world. I have large, beautiful visions, but I don't know what that's gonna look like written in the words, right? Written into the law. But I know the my role, I know my skill set, and that's what I'm gonna use. So I also wanna say that figuring out what's the thing that you can offer and doing that well, rather than trying to be and do everything, and knowing when's your point to step back, right? When people ask you about things that you're like, outside of my purview, and that's okay. We can point to other people, but not trying to do and be everything, but be really good at the thing we're doing while lifting up the work of other folks. There are enough of us. Um, one of the things I really like about the contemporary movement for black lives is the idea that we don't have a singular leader, right? You can't like kill the one leader and then you kill the movement. We have lots of leaders. We are leader full. And so that's what I want to see more in disability justice is us resisting um, the celebrity model of movement work and really understanding how we are all contributing in different ways and have our specific areas of what we're doing. So I'm mindful of the time, but but no, I'm okay. Okay. So I want to ask a, a slightly different question okay. about um, the way you're thinking about yourself and your role in these efforts may have evolved over the course of the book, because you've you've talked to people in various contexts who are activists. You've you've looked at the history, um, and I what you just articulated about recognizing this is what I can do and that's what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna do it to the best of my ability. Is that how you came to the book or is that how you left the book? I, yes and yes and yes. Okay. Um, you know, I went into the book wanting it to chart this activist history to show that black people have been doing this. We've been doing it. Um, it just doesn't look the same. It doesn't use the same words, but it's there, right? It's an investment in addressing disabling violence and ensuring quality medical care and healthcare and larger supports. And again, trying to address the way that racism is disabling um, and fighting against that disabling violence. So that was like the goal. But I think in the wake of 2020, and that was the first time for me that I was really on the ground um, in a concrete, consistent way, because what else was I doing uh, in June of 2020 but sitting in my house? So I was in the streets. Um, so that for me changed changed it from what was more of like a intellectual research, speaking to an academic audience, to really about the praxis element. So I think the praxis is what shifted in writing the book. Um, also, I, I mentioned my own identity process. Um, so I did the interviews in 2019, and I was already identifying as disabled to friends, but I wasn't really public about it. Again, was still on the fence about claiming it publicly. And doing these interviews with black disabled activists is what tipped it for me, um, was really talking to folks about what's the value of it? Um, if again, if I'm not getting any formal accommodations, if I'm not so, what what's the point of doing this? Um, and so many of the Black disabled activists I interviewed talked about the same thing of not forcing identity on folks, but understanding it as a tool to come into community. Um, and so that tipped it for me. So for me, coming out of the book, there was much more of an activist approach and an identity approach that um, just came out of the process and the time that it was being written in. Um, and now I feel like as I go on tour with the book and talk about it, that, that this is part of the advocacy work, is me talking about what has happened with the book, but making sure that people know that it's open access, encouraging people to read it, um, to use it in like reading groups and book clubs, um, using it in nonprofit settings, really getting it out there and hoping that it reaches more black people than I think an average academic book might reach. So in terms of reaching people, I've, I have a note here. Um, you've got a lot of Twitter followers. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I wonder if you want to say anything. About, I mean, the book is one medium for reaching people, right, and helping to build these relationships that are essential to the these progressive alliances that we're talking about. 
How do you think about Twitter? And how do you think about Twitter now versus not that long ago? Yeah, I mean, tomorrow the the check marks are going away and it's just going to be the wild, wild west. So who knows? Um, Twitter has just been my preferred medium as a person who prefers writing over anything else. Um, so it's just been the platform that I've used the most. And I do feel like it has connected me to so much organizing. I mean, hashtag disability Twitter has taught me so much. Um, it's a place that I often go when I'm seeking advice and perspectives and resources. Um, so I get a lot out of it, but I do think it has become a way for me to circulate the work and the ideas from the work, make connections for people. Like if something's happening um, in the news or in pop culture, I might say like, oh, hey, well, if you want to read more about this, like here's a chapter um, and I can link directly to that like downloadable chapter. So the public intellectual work for me has been um, a really important part of this. Um, I'm grateful for you know these platforms and folks inviting me to talk about it. And so for me, they all kind of feed into one another. I think that people know about me and invite me places because they've seen me on Twitter. And then because people see then my name associated with like d various universities and they follow me on Twitter and it just becomes a, a cycle. But it's, it's a way of getting the work out there. So for me, it's just, it's another tool to distribute the work. And as an academic who's ambivalent about being an academic, I never thought I would be an academic. I never thought I was gonna be a professor. I didn't see people who looked like me. Um, it just like kept working. I was like, I'll do this until it stops working, until I fail, and then it just hasn't yet. Um, but I, at any point, I am willing to step outside of the academy. Um, I am not married to this for my whole life. Um, but the, I want the work to get out there. That's what I care about. I want the ideas out there. I love research and writing, and so Twitter is is another tool to like distribute that information. Um, and I've just met a lot of great folks that way. Um, you know, Alice Wong, I have only known online, but I got to meet her on this le on coming here, so I got to actually see her in person. So there are these real sustained connections um, that have taught me so much that I've gotten out of those spaces as well. Okay, I have one more, and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna pivot to to questions. Um, and that is, in pragmatic terms, again for folks who are here, for folks who are who are watching us, are there particular takeaways? that you would want to emphasize for them? And in, in the book, I know you, you say that people should take what they need, which I really appreciated. But I suspect you have ideas for how you want this to this conversation to influence us. Um, I want people to know that black people have been organizing around disability issues for a very long time. Um, I say in the book, you know, I start with the Panthers because that was the organization that I started the book research with. Um, but this exists long before the Panthers too, right? This is not the only example. Um, and there are other great scholars who are doing that. You can get in those footnotes to get all those details. Um, so that's the first thing. We are not new to this. This is not new to us and we are not new to this kind of organizing, no matter what the disability rights history might look like on paper um, right now. So I think that's one thing. Um, and then, yeah, that last point of T.L. Lewis's definition, you do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. I think it's just so important <laughs> for people to realize that it doesn't matter how you identify, this system is going is going to get you. Um, and so it, it behooves all of us to have that critical eye and start resisting it rather than trying to prove that we are not disabled in whatever ways or not as disabled in whatever ways and actually resist that oppression rather than trying to step away from it and let it hit somebody else. Okay. Can I pivot to see whether we have questions in either here or online? Hi, yes, we have questions from the room. We've passed out cards and uh, Aaron will uh, collect. And uh, we have questions from the Zoom room. And so Aaron and Tina and we're collecting the questions and we'll give them to Jonathan um, to take a look. I didn't realize I was curating too. That's, that's, addi <laughs> that's additional pressure. A 
Okay. Got this it. is Cla this is Claudia. Aaron, you can use some. You can put the good ones on top if you have ideas. Uh, Do you want me to like do something while you read those? <laughs> no. All no, right, you the, got it. The, I've got I've got a winner here on the first one, so I I'm good with. Uh, yeah, no. Then uh, this this I'm I'm I'm. These are already thoughtful questions. So, <laughs> you've talked about race studies needing to bring in elements of disability studies. Can you expand on your thoughts about disability studies working to include critical race studies? And then there's a parenthetical. I ask because I worry about disability studies continuing to be white-centered. Yeah. Well, I think that for one, it would just be helpful if people who are doing disability studies, that their study is based on all white, whatever it is, all white text, all white media, all white interview participants, just say that. Just say this is a white study. This is a study of old white text. This is what old white dead men said about disability. Like, great, now we know that, right? Rather than saying this is how disability has been represented in literature, like, no, in this specific old dead white literature. That would help. It would help to just say that sometimes um, and know that it might not be applicable. Um, otherwise, you know, I am really hesitant to encourage disability studies scholars that do not have any training in critical race studies, do not have connections to communities of color, deciding to just start doing race. Um, I think that there are folks who have done it really well, but I would prefer to see more folks coming to disability studies and learning disability studies approaches who already have that basis in critical race studies. Um, I say, for example, you know, the folks who are doing black history, that it's already in the archive. All they need is the lens to suddenly look differently at this material and they're gonna see disability in there. And so just having more folks come in. So I think, I want disability studies folks to, white disability studies folks to just know that you don't have to do it all. You can actually just like step back and let other people do things, um, collaborate with people, and again, name when your work is white. Just name it. Um, I think a lot of my academic career and a lot of my publishing has been like, here's this concept from disability studies that we talk about as being like universal way of thinking about disability. And here's how it doesn't apply to black literature, black experiences. Um, and just constantly being like, actually that's really white and that's really white. That's like most of my, <laughs> most of my work. Um, so I just, yeah, I want people to be able to name it and not name it with shame. Like there's value in studying this and doing comparative approaches. Just name it rather than leaving it unnamed and assuming that it applies more broadly than it might. Really you're talking about positionality, right? If, if I'm understanding correct, okay. This is an easy one. Are you planning to, on releasing an audiobook version of the book? Audible. Do it already. Yeah, we're trying. Um, Duke has, you know, they have a relationship with Audible. They made an audiobook for my first book. Um, I have asked many questions. I have someone in mind to do the voicing of it, but we have not heard back. So if anyone has connections with Audible, please let me know, because we're trying to make it happen. Um, but it's something that is outside of Duke's ability to produce their own, so they have to rely on someone else doing it. So it is something we want to do um, that I wish could happen sooner, but it is outside of my hands. But yeah, something we're working on. Okay. You discuss the Panthers and the NBWHP. If you had a magic wand and could update the strategic vision of one black wellness slash activist organization, which one would you choose and why? Like in the book or in general? In general. Mm, that's a lot of options. I mean, so I think that reproductive justice movements, when I think about like Sister Song, now I see disability showing up, but I would love to like go back and wave that wand and make disability far more integrated into the, the reproductive justice framework earlier because I think it's so obvious, right? If we take reproductive justice to mean the right to have a child, not have a child, and raise a child safely, right? 
there's so much <laughs> around disability justice that could be in that. So I think that I would love to have seen that be more prominent earlier on in the reproductive justice movement, which to me is a black led movement um, by folks like Loretta Ross. Um, so Sister Song, I would love to see that explicit, right? Just explicitly in there earlier, even though it is now, I think every time I see something that um, Loretta Ross writes, disability is, is now a very prominent part of it. Um, this is Claudia. We're going to have one oral question from the audience. Hello there. My name's Will. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. I have um, two questions. Um, so I'm a, a historian, so I'm going to come at it from a different angle. But as you were speaking, I was thinking about one of the things we have access to is a lot of the adverts of runaway slaves and maroon slaves. And the way they would describe the slaves very often is to make comments on their their disability. So and so had a scar here. So and so was whipped on this part of his their his or her body or their body. And so I'm wondering how then that works into this history. And then moving from that, within the, the context of slavery, we start to understand how black people with disability, disabled black folk, become terrorizing to the enslavers. And we see this in contemporary societies where I'm at Berkeley and me meaning me saying I'm disabled or asking for my accommodations terrorizes the instructors. And so I want to unearth from slavery this relationship between disabled black bodies and terrorization. And then my final kind of comment, understanding everything you said, is when you're a historian or when you're a theory person writing with history, you have to be careful not to archive black thought. And what I mean by that is not to aggrandize historical activism to the extent that you then forget about contemporary activism. And so I'm wondering then, when you talk about the Panthers, however great they are, and you talk about contemporary BLM, how do you make sure one doesn't silence the other? Um, so for the point around slave, runaway slave advertisements, there are some folks who have written about this. Um, so I'm going to blank on her last name, but Jennifer is something with a B. Somebody in here might know. Um, one of the articles is like Mothering the Useless, um, which is like in scare quotes. Um, so there are some folks who have written about this history and kind of identifying the way that disability um, was used to identify folks, but also critiquing the idea that disabled slaves were just like tossed to the side or were considered less worthy and actually finding examples of disabled slaves being put to other kinds of work, not necessarily in the fields, but still being forced to work at the same pace. And so disability actually not being a negation of work value at all um, in that context. So I think it's there. It's not my area of expertise, right, that, um, that part of history, but it's definitely there in the way that a lot of the way that black folks show up in the archive, right? There are just a lot of black disabled folks showing up in the archive. And we also see the way that disability was forced on to enslaved people um, as punishment for running away. So it's both and, right? It's folks who are disabled in working contexts, but also disabled as a punishment. Um, so like cutting the Achilles tendon, for example, right? Um, in terms of the contemporary, I say explicitly in the book that the goal is not to aggrandize or trash, right? The goal is to say, here's some things that are important and interesting that we can learn from, and here's some things that they could have done better, whether or not they knew, but like here's some things we can learn. So I talk about missteps, right? Things that could have been different um, in a way that I hope shows that I value and respect and see the things that we can learn and build upon. And for me, it's more about building that connection, seeing that for me, the roots of disability justice are in some of this work. It's already there. Like we can see that history um, that I think is just so important to say that this didn't just pop up in 2005 when we coined the term disability justice, right? There's been this intersectional work on disability happening in communities of color for a long time, um, even if it is imperfect. And so I, I hope that I get that across in the book that, yeah, it wasn't perfect. There are things that we can go in and critique, but that doesn't diminish the reality of the clear way that 
the Panthers were making connections between ableism and racism and making connections between the refusal of the government to like provide enough funding to actually support people, right? That was there and that's still valuable even if it's not exactly what we would want to see today um, in the hopes that that's continually the way that we engage with movement work is to say, we're not perfect yet. Here's some things that could be better and here are things that are good and here's how we're going to keep learning and growing on from that um, because I do think the Panthers get put in this um, like iconic hero position um, that can be a little problematic then like they weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination um, but we also don't need to go to the level of like demonizing them either um, so in the last chapter I talk a little bit about the way that the Panthers show up in our contemporary memory I mentioned like the Beyonce Super Bowl performance and the way people responded to that um, to say that like th they hold such an iconic position for us um, in ways that I think is polarizing and I would like to see a more balanced approach to understanding their history and their organizing Okay, I'm going to combine two questions Great. now because they, they seem to me to move in a, a similar direction. First, can you talk about bringing the praxis and pragmatism into personal and private life and how you change your relationships to reflect these ideas? And the question I view as related is how do you respond in a manner acceptable to survive in certain contexts? i.e. being a trans lawyer um, masking for the sake of a client when you're constantly confronted with dehumanizing violence? That's a lot. Um, okay, can you read them again? I can read them again. <laughs> I see these as linked because they yep. are talking about about personal right personal incorporation of some of the lessons of, of okay. Can you talk about bringing the praxis and pragmatism into personal private personal slash private life and how you change your relationships to reflect these ideas? And how do you respond in a manner acceptable to survive in certain contexts, i.e., being a trans lawyer masking for the sake of a client, when you are constantly confronted with dehumanizing violence? Okay, on the personal level, I believe in building communities of accountability. Um, so I really like Mia Minkus, M-I-N-G-U-S, um, her work on um, accountability pods, where we talk about building communities and building relationships where we are holding each other accountable in real ways, um, not in cancel cultures, social media, exaggerated ways but like a real person that I'm gonna sit down with and be like you we're gonna talk about what just happened and we're gonna make sure that there's the harm is addressed and so building those communities and those relationships that's where I'm at in that interpersonal level is really investing in people that want to be held accountable want to learn want to grow and that will do the same for me um, my biggest fear is becoming like an out of touch full professor that like doesn't understand the world anymore um, I really want to make sure that people don't let that happen to me. Like keep keep holding me accountable when I say wild things. Um, so that's that interpersonal level. Like who are the people that want to learn? You know, especially once we're out of like learning context, who's the person that's like gonna send me that video to be like, you wanna watch this video together, you wanna learn together, you wanna do this. Um, that's where I'm at on that interpersonal. And then when it comes to survival, I think for me, it's a matter of reminding myself why I'm doing it and deciding when it is worth it. There's going to be a point where things aren't worth it. It's not worth uh, the amount of violence and uh, masking or misgendering or whatever is happening to me, it's not worth it anymore. Um, and only you can decide where that is for you, right? Like what, that, what level is okay, but for, or, or not okay, but is able to be tolerated and I think for me, it's having folks around me that can remind me that this is something that is happening because of oppression, not because of me. Um, and that I have space where I don't have to do that, right? Um, so for me, it's like, I need people that are not academics in my life where I can just like not be the person in front of the room with the microphone. I can just be the person like in the corner and having a drink. Um, I need spaces where I can be myself, um, be comfortable, and so, creating those spaces outside of whatever that workspace is that might be harmful and oppressive, I think is another thing. 
Um, but yeah, nobody can tell you what level of acceptable is, like what other people can deal with because of the other things they might have in their life, right? Um, other privileges they might have, they may be able to tolerate some things at work that are not tolerable for other folks. Um, so I don't think anybody can tell you what you can do, what is necessary for survival. Um, yeah, I just, I don't think anybody can because there's so many factors involved in like money <laughs> and uh, accommodations and other kinds of support that you have to negotiate that within your own life context. Um, yeah, what is tolerable, what is necessary for your survival um, and on, on like beyond just a, a bare minimum bodily level, like also in terms of your like heart and your mind and your pleasure, um, what is necessary and, and in what ways can you steal moments of liberation within it. Um, this is like a very minor example, but I recently put a couch in my office. Being able to lay down when I'm having a lot of pain between meetings is a game changer. And not lay down on the floor, which is what I used to do. Lay down on a tile floor. Not great. Um, so just stealing these moments of like on the clock time of like, I'm going to take 10 minutes, just 10 minutes to close my eyes and lay down um, and just get the pressure off my back, um, it makes a huge difference. So I also encourage stealing <laughs> moments of liberation inside of your workspace or school space. Just take it um, wherever you can, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my moderator's privilege. In the book, you also talk about the focus on self-care that it, for a time was a, an institutional objective. Um, and I won wonder if you wanna say more about how that came to be and then came not to be with the growth of the organization. I'm, for, I'm forgive me. I'm blanking. The National Black Women's Health Project. Um, yeah. So a big part of the National Black Women's Health Project when they started was this concept of self-help, um, and they had self-help groups that they formed for Black women. Typically, about three to ten Black women who would meet um, on a weekly basis, either in someone's home, in a church basement, in a community center, but in some space and community. And the goal was for women to talk and share about their health experiences, what's going on in their lives, and to support one another. Another. So this concept of self-help really came from what do we need to change internally or address internally to make positive changes in our lives. Um, so that might be talking to someone to realize like, oh, there's another way of approaching this or I'm not alone in this, um, just getting advice and dealing with internalized oppression was one of the big goals of the self-help groups. Um, so I really consider them also to be very consciousness raising groups. And that faded from the organization's um, primary programming because of funding. Um, and this has come up in a couple of my talks that people have asked more about it. But essentially, as they started to rely on more federal and foundation funding, they were unable to support the self-help groups as much because they couldn't document the change in this like calculable way, right? So if we're meeting every three weeks and you know I have diabetes and you have hypertension and we're not like measuring my sugar every, we're not putting out numbers for the meeting. The meetings were supposed to be confidential. So the organizers would report back to say, yeah, we met this many times, this many people came, but you couldn't show like this many people change their relationship to cholesterol, right? Um, and that's what the funding wanted. Funders wanted concrete, hard numbers and evidence. And it was just harder and harder to prove. So they moved away from that model to other things like the Walking for Wellness program where they could say, we had 50 black women walk five miles, right? Here's some numbers for you. Um, and so it faded because of that, which I think any of us who tries to get funding for anything <laughs> know that it is sometimes hard to get funding for things where you can't demonstrate a clear, concrete, visible, outcome. Um, but the organization talked about that, of being like, this work might not have an effect immediately. And it might, people might even reject what we're offering them. And that is all fine. Like, this is part of the work. Um, and I do think that we can see from the organization how many black women went on to do other kinds of organizing. It was really like a training hub in many ways. Um, but again, that concrete outcome. So funding, which is, yeah, I think a lot of us can relate to 
struggles with getting funding for the thing we actually want to do because we have to prove some sort of impact that might not be as able to be demonstrated. Um, okay. th this is Claudia. I just want to let you know that it's 8.15. This is going brilliantly. We love it. And we wanted to let you know that Jennifer, oh wait, what's the name again? Jennifer Barkley is who you were trying to I think said of. Jennifer B. I was close. Somebody, yeah. I didn't know that if someone texted it to me. So <laughs> there you go. Thank you, that someone. Okay, back, back to questions. Back to analogies. Can you please speak a little bit more about how the experience of disability and more specifically being black and disabled is ignored because folks might be trying to analogize to white and or non-disabled folks' experiences? Analogies can also be seen as an accessibility tool. Are there analogies to being black and disabled that are not reductive or generalizing? I think, I'm not saying analogies have no place in our world, right? But the examples um, that I can give that I think can be problematic. So there are examples in um, disability rights organizing, for example, and getting access to um, the to public transit where there were signs that white disabled activists had that said we can't even get on the bus right which has this suggestion <laughs> of black people have already gotten their rights right and this is a discourse that comes up kind of frequently in disability rights organizing this idea that disabled people are the last people to get their rights and black people already got it right so this <laughs> eliminates anything that we're still dealing with with racism, but also um, the challenges specific to black disabled people, right? So these kinds of analogies where it is comparing in order to kind of denigrate, right, um, intentionally or not, can be a problem. I also see on the other side that I've had a lot of black folks say, well, just being black in general is a disability. And I'm like, I get it. It's a disadvantage. There's all this stuff that comes with it, but <clears throat> saying it's a disability doesn't actually help us then understand the distinction of what disability is in our culture and what it is like to be a black disabled person. So those are the kind of like analogies I'm talking about where we're kind of comparing two experiences in ways that kind of reduces the, the real tangibility of, of one experience in the name of lifting up another or highlighting another. Um, but I do think that there are other ways that we can make these connections by talking about similarities, right? Um, I think that that can be useful. You know, when I talked about, for example, my reaction um, to any kind of engagement with police um, as being being called paranoid, right? It doesn't mean that I am saying I have a diagnosis and I have this, but that it is that there's a relationship between these things. So I think when our analogies emphasize relationship rather than comparison in a ranking kind of way, that's where we can have more nuance. But anytime we try to simplify, you know, there's gonna be things that we miss. Um, but those are really the ones that um, I'm trying to push back against are the ways that I have continued to see white disabled people talking about blackness as if we have gotten everything that we need. You know, um, there was a disability studies journal not that long ago that had a, a special issue titled Disabled Lives Matter. And I'm like, mm, yes. And <laughs> we don't need to borrow and steal um, in these ways. Like there are other ways that we can emphasize these connections. There was a relatively recent law review article titled Blackness as Disability. So it, it's, it, mm -hmm. it's both ways. Um, do you think people slash countries with a history of colonial, co excuse me, colonization have parallels with black community struggle of identifying with disability? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, colonization in so many ways like has done harm to people's body minds, right? So there is like the direct physical violence that's happened for folks. There is the trauma of um, potentially being denied access to your culture, to your language. Um, so 100%, I think that colonization um, and imperialism in general are disabling forces as well um, and have direct connections to ableism in the ways that often colonizers then said, well, this 
group of people or this thing that you do in your culture is inferior, right? It's another way of adding this label of inferiority that gets associated with disability. Um, so I think that absolutely we see that. Um, there are other folks that do this work, but yeah, I think that there are many ways that in a very literal sense, colonization results in disability and in these like metaphoric senses, um, we see the way that ableism and labels of disability get used in racialized ways in this context to justify other forms of violence, um, segregation, and harm that's occurring. Okay, this has four questions on it. Okay. But I'm only gonna I'm I'm only gonna ask one with apologies to the author of the four questions. What might a volume on queer disability politics look like? Well, uh, I would recommend reading Robert McRuer's work, Crip Theory. Um, but I think that queer disability politics would have to engage with the history of both uh, gender dysphoria and homosexuality in the DSM. Um, I think it would need to engage with the history of AIDS organizing. Um, as clear histories <laughs> of queer disability politics and organizing. Um, so those would be the ones that I would highlight. And I think in a contemporary way, um, you know, I don't have like recent data on this, but I do wonder if anyone is looking at the queer community response to monkeypox and the quick way that so many of us got vaccinated um, and the fact that a study that I saw a couple weeks ago indicated that the folks that were most impacted by it were black folks. Um, I think that there's some queer disability politics in that moment that seems to have like disappeared from our minds entirely, but was like last year. Um, so yeah, those would be some things that I would want to see, but I think engaging with the way that um, queerness writ large and gender nonconformity writ large has been represented as lack of able-mindedness, um, I think is super important. And then again, disabling violence. Like I think, uh, not conservation, the other word, conversion, there we go, conversion therapy. I was like, conservation therapy. Uh, conversion therapy, I think, is disabling violence. I think it's so harmful. Uh, I was raised Catholic. We had like someone come as a converted gay and talk to my high school when I was 16, talk about how he used to be gay and he's not anymore. Um, I think it's super, super harmful. So there are lots of ways that I think queer disability politics would do this kind of work. But I think in some ways it overlaps with that like health activism. Um, that's really important, particularly in terms of HIV AIDS. When researching parentheses black, close parentheses, disability history, did you find most recollections or written documentation to be from non-BIPOC folks or not? If so, why? Lack of equitable access to publishing or something else? Mm. So, yes and no. The things that I was looking at in terms of the two organizations, the Black Panthers and the National Black Women's Health Project, the work that folks were doing on those organizations is done by black folks primarily, but they're not talking about disability, right? I'm reading those um, academic articles and those books and I am bringing the lens of disability to it to then like reinterpret it in the book. So again, there are folks that are doing this work, they're just not bringing that lens as explicitly, which is what I hope this book can help people do. Um, and then the work that has been done um, that I was drawing from disability studies, yes, is primarily done by white folks um, writing about black disabled history, um, at least at the time period that I'm doing. There are some folks um, that are doing things in a, a more distant past. But yeah, mostly, mostly white people in disability studies still. I want to I want to come back to the second part of the question. Do you, if so, why, and is it lack of equitable access to? Oh, yeah. Well, I think that I think that disability studies is primarily white because for a lot of white disabled people that is their marginalized identity. That is the identity that they organize around. That is the identity that is most impactful for them because they don't think about their whiteness or their straightness or their cisness in the same way. Um, and so a lot of white folks 
flocked to, white disabled folks flocked to disability studies in a way that I don't think black disabled folks did um, and have. I think they've stayed in, in black studies or in other realms. Um, so I think that it's about the ways in which we identify. There's some work um, by some disability studies folks about consciousness raising and how for a lot of disabled folks of color, race was their primary like organizing lens because they're being raised in a community of folks of color and maybe not having any connection to a disability community, right? For a lot of disabled folks, we are born into families and communities that don't look like us and don't have the same experiences. So if that is the only political lens that you have, then you're gonna go find those other folks. But if you have kind of that black political lens, you might still stay in that area. So I think it's like that difference in experience, um, but then not just access to publishing, I think access to higher education in the first place, to become an academic, to do the research, to do the publishing, I think it is much harder to be a disabled person of color and get through secondary school, let alone higher education. So I think it's not just the publishing element. Um, I think that there are folks that are kind of eager to publish this work. It's just that to actually get folks through all the other hurdles of academia um, is incredibly difficult. Okay, I'm gonna come back to the fourth of those four questions. This seems like a good a good one to, to perhaps close if there aren't, I don't know if there are more questions, okay. Which mainstream media outlets have featured you and which ones need to? <laughs> Um, let's see, I, the book was featured in Ebony, which was really exciting to me, because I really, that was the first time that like a black specific mainstream um, featured my work. Um, that was really exciting. Uh, I was on the podcast Getting Curious with Jonathan Van Ness, V-A-N-N-E-S-S. -S. Um, that was super fun. So let's see, where else would I, I mean, I would just love more black specific mainstream, um, whether that is like a digital, like Blavity, um, or something like something else, just I, I wanna see more black orgs and mainstream media outlets covering disability in a critical way, rather than just in these kind of uplifting, heartwarming stories. Um, so any of them would be great. Um, but yeah, Ebony is the one that was very exciting for me. I like still have the, the screenshot of it pinned on my Instagram, if you go to my Instagram, because it was a happy moment to finally get it there. So I want to thank Dr. Schalk. This has really been an honor to participate in the conversation with you and hear how you're thinking and hear so many pragmatic suggestions that I, I hope that all of us have picked up on, on what we can do differently, right, to demonstrate empathy in our personal and potentially professional lives going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Confirm, sweetie pie. You made it. <laughs>